Hello again. All right, so today we're going to continue with the uh, with digestion, and we're just going to really trace um, through the digestive system. So we're going to start with the mouth and the esophagus, and move into the stomach and small and large intestines, and then talk about uh, what's being done in each one of these sections and the role that the accessory organs play as well. So mouth and esophagus is where we're going to begin. That's where you ingest. So remember we talked about that each part of the digestive system has a particular function or, or actually um, may have more than one function, I should say it that way. So for uh, the mouth, it's involved in ingestion or bringing the food and water into the body, okay? There's also teeth there that break down by chewing the uh, food, which we call the mechanical breakdown. We also have to propel the food uh, from the front of our mouth to the back of our mouth, and so the tongue and the mouth are going to be used to push that to the back of our throat. So we call that um, propulsion. And the actual act of swallowing is called deglutition. So that's the fancy word for swallowing. Those of you that are going into um, a medical field, is, that's definitely a word uh, that you would need to know. Um, so I didn't put this on the slide because I wanted to see if maybe you could remember back from your first anatomy. Uh, the act of chewing, and remember you have a muscle that's kind of a primary mover in chewing called a masseter. So what's the other word for chewing? Mastication. Mastication. Okay, so uh, just want to make sure you remember that because you may see the word masticate in the uh, exam and you should know what it means, but I'm just reminding you. All right, so deglutition is swallowing. There's also actual digestion, and remember we learned that digestion is just dissolving, so there's actually breakdown, chemical breakdown inside the mouth, and that's occurring um, with saliva, and or spit, and so saliva has some enzymes, a uh, salivary amylase, uh, amylase tells you that it's for sugar, and a lingual lipase, so that gives you a hint that it's for fat. So you're starting your initial breakdown of sugars and fats inside your mouth. There's really no absorption going on in the mouth, except for a few drugs. Uh, so for example, if you're having a heart attack, and you take a nitroglycerin, put it under your tongue, that can be absorbed under your tongue, uh, so in the mouth. So there is some absorption that we use uh, medicinally um, or uh, recreationally, some drugs, you, you can do that way. Uh, but as far as nutrients, uh, not really. So those salivary glands, you have several. You have your parotids, which are kind of those big ones here. You have your submandibulars, which are going to be below the mandible, and then sublingual below the tongue. And we'll talk more about this on the lab portion. And there's a couple of small minor ones, but these are the three you'll need to recognize uh, on the lab test. Uh, <clears throat> why do we have saliva? Well, we know that it's for digestion, right? We know that it allows you to begin the breakdown of food with those enzymes. But it's also there to help cleanse the mouth, so it keeps your mouth moist and helps wash away bacteria and try to cleanse your mouth. It helps to uh, be a water source to dissolve the food. Um, if you think back to your special senses, remember olfaction and gustation. So gustation was to taste. Uh, in order for your, your um, taste buds to be uh, activated, those uh, molecules have to be dissolved in water. So it allows you to dissolve the food in water so that you can taste it. Remember sodium ions for salt, sugar for sweet. Um, it also helps to uh, moisten the food and allows you to form a bolus. So when you chew the food, it kind of becomes a big clump in the back uh, for you to swallow it down. It's, and that big thing that you swallow, the big mass of food that you swallow after you've chewed it and mixed it with saliva is called a bolus. Now, if you have bad breath, uh, we call that halitosis, and that's really just due to rotting food. So there are bacteria in your mouth, and they're going to start to digest that food themselves, and their byproduct is a sulfur uh, compound. So when you smell bad breath, it's just the bacteria breaking down the food, and you smell that sulfur. Uh, so floss your teeth. That's one reason you can get bad breath is food's caught down in your teeth, and it's going to rot and smell like rotten eggs. So floss. Uh, so what does saliva have in it? Well, it's mostly water, okay? It's slightly acidic. It does contain some electrolytes like sodium, potassium, chloride, and phosphate, and bicarbonate. 
It's got those enzymes, one for sugar, one for fat. It also has mucin. So, you know that mucousy kind of feeling you have in your mouth? That's like a barrier to help kind of keep it from drying out. So it helps keep your mouth moist, uh, kind of slimy. <laughs> Um, it's got some metabolic waste that are going to be excreted in your mouth, um, like urea type uh, metabolic wastes. And it's also part of your immune system. So there are going to be some things secreted in your mouth, uh, like lysozymes and some immunoglobulins and things like that, that help form a kind of a chemical barrier, um, this immunolog immunologic barrier against things getting into your system. So your immune system does release some things into your mouth um, as a barrier against bacteria and things like that. We know that inside your mouth uh, you have your tongue and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the tongue. The tongue is that big muscle in your mouth that you need for speech and you also need for chewing and it's actually used to push that food to the back of the mouth. Um, some of you may have covered the tongue in detail in 201, some of you may not have so just we're not going to do that. We're not going to talk a lot about the tongue as far as how it works. It's a pretty amazing organ, uh, so I do encourage you to go Google some stuff about the tongue. It's just kind of neat the way it works, but we're just not going to focus on that. So obviously you should know that the tongue is part of the mouth, okay? Now, and in, in, involved in, um, in digestion, it's got to push that food to the back of the throat and help keep the food in between your teeth to chew it up. The teeth are what's actually doing the mechanical breakdown, so they're going to be the grinders and the chewers and the terrors. Uh, Terrors, not terror like in scary. <laughs> Lisa, how would you? How do you? Terrors. I don't even think that's a real word. <laughs> mm, probably not. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about teeth um, when we get to the lab portion, uh, but we will talk about it a little bit now and then more detail later. Remember, you have uh, top teeth and bottom teeth. Uh, and so if you remember, you lost your teeth as a child, those are your baby teeth. We call those deciduous teeth because they fall out. Like you have deciduous trees that lose their leaves in the fall. So deciduous teeth are baby teeth. Uh, then those are replaced with your permanent teeth or your adult teeth. And uh, we'll talk about how many teeth you have and what they're called uh, later on. But they do have particular functions. You have the ones that are for cutting, ones that uh, can tear and pierce, uh, ones that are starting that you use for grinding and crushing and then some really big grinders. So we'll talk about this a little bit more in lab, but these are their functions. The incisors are your, your biters, you know, they like bite an apple. Your canines are like rip a piece of meat. Your premolar to start that chewing process and those back molars to really grind it up. Okay, so I'll show you what, where, where these are in lab. You just need another functions right now. We also want to do a brief anatomy of the teeth. If some of you may be going into dental assisting, uh, so you'll get a whole lot of this later on. Uh, but remember, you have your teeth are in those alveolar processes of your mandible and maxilla, and uh, they are connected uh, by a gomphosis. So you remember, you have something that holds those teeth into place. Um, and each tooth has its own vasculature and nerve. So there's a, an artery and a vein inside the, the uh, tooth. This is called the root canal, which is where the artery and the vein and the nerve are. Everything that's below the gum is called the root of the tooth. That part that's kind of in the gum, this is called the neck of the tooth. And everything that you can see, that's called the crown. Uh, kind of the two main things I want you, uh, or I guess three main things I want you to think about are the enamel, the dentin, and the pulp. So the pulp is that part deep inside the tooth that has the artery and vein and uh, nerves. Then you have the dentin, which really makes the, the, the bulk of the tooth. Okay, so that's, that kind of forms the tooth, and you can think of the enamel as a hard shell around it. Um, the, the problem with enamel is that it typically, it can be worn and broken, uh, and when it is broken, then you expose the dentin and you allow um, for cavities to be formed. And enamel can be easily damaged, so you have to be real protective of your enamel and use special toothpastes and try to be careful. Don't crunch ice, things like that. Because um, you break into the dentin and break into that pulp, that's where the nerve roots are, and that will give you a toothache. <laughs> All right? So just a little bit of, you know, basic tooth anatomy um, for this course. Again, if you're going into dental assisting, you'll learn a lot about the teeth.
So we've taken that food, we've chewed it up, we've added saliva to it. The tongue is going to push it back to the back of the throat. We're going to swallow it, so deglutition. Now it's got to move into the rest of the digestive system. So the next place it's going to go, it's got to go through the back of the throat, the oral pharynx, back behind the voice box, the laryngeal pharynx. What's going to keep it from going down into your lungs? The epiglottis. Okay. So the epiglottis is going to close over the trachea. The food will continue behind the voice box and go down into the esophagus, which is that tube that's right behind the trachea that goes down into the stomach. Okay. Uh, all the esophagus is is a large uh, muscular tube that goes from your laryngeal pharynx, so the top of right, right, right about right here, uh, to your stomach. Okay, it actually goes through the diaphragm before it enters into the stomach, and that's called the esophageal hiatus. So uh, if you look at a diaphragm, there's actually a hole in the diaphragm, and the esophagus has to go through that hole to get to the stomach. Okay. Uh, there is a gastroesophageal sphincter that has to open and allow contents to go into the stomach. So what's going on uh, as food is moving through the digestive system? This is a good time to kind of talk about that while we're in the esophagus because this is the main role of the esophagus is just propulsion. Okay, that's what it does. There's really no digestion um, going on. But there is some mechanical breakdown. Okay, so no chemical breakdown. Uh, but there is some mechanical breakdown. So as food is going through the esophagus, all right, it's going to be pushed down, it's going to be propelled down, and the way we do that, the term for that is called peristalsis, and it's a wave-like propulsion, so kind of a propulsion in a wave. So it's, does that make sense? So think about a toothpaste tube. I wish I had one here. If you had a toothpaste tube and you kind of kind of squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it until it kind of comes up the top, that would be kind of peristalsis. So it's kind of moving things in a wave-like contraction. So you can kind of see this wave of contraction just goes down the esophagus and pushes it into, um, into the stomach. Now, you can also have what's called segmentation. Uh, and uh, the other thing that happens as... as um, food is moving through the system, uh, those waves can kind of, um, let's see how to explain this. It's kind of a 2D, and I'm trying to think about this in 3D. Uh, let's say this is food particle A, and this is food particle B. Okay, they're two different pieces of food, and they're going down one behind each other. Well, as that peristaltic wave is, is moving down, the next wave that comes through, instead of wrapping around that piece of food, might actually kind of pinch off and break that piece of food in half. Okay, so we've segmented it, all right? And so you've done the same thing here. You've segmented uh, number B, and then the next wave that comes through puts these two together, and you get basically a combination of food called food particle C. So you're moving it down, and then you're breaking it apart and mixing it as it moves down, and that's called segmentation. So there's some movement and mixing as the food moves through the alimentary canal. And that's how we propel it through, using those two processes. Uh, just some basic structure, what the alimentary canal looks like. Um, we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail on this. We'll talk a little bit more in the lab portion. But we know that um, we have to have uh, a lot of blood supply. So you're going to see a really hearty blood supply, arteries in there arteries and veins and lymphatics and nervous system are all going to be innervating and feeding and uh, allowing blood flow in and blood flow out of the, um, of the digestive system. Um, you're also going to see that there is, it's uh, made up of smooth muscle. So you have all this smooth muscle. And the smooth muscle, if you'll look, it goes in kind of different directions. So think about that peristaltic wave and segmentation and you can understand that the fibers of these muscles are kind of need to go in different directions in order to make things go down and also to break them apart. Uh, and in certain parts of your body where it's just kind of really grinding and twisting and, and, and mechanically digesting. So having these uh, muscle fibers going in different directions um, allows you to have kind of that, that movement. Um, there's also going to be uh, some mucosal glands associated with the uh, the digestive tract because we have to have some mucus uh, that serves as protection for the for the uh, intestines so that you don't have any your digestive enzymes digesting you so it protects you from your own digestive enzymes 
So you're going to have some glands for uh, mucus. Uh, and those glands are exocrine glands. I'm just kind of taking it back to 201 here, which means they release whatever they're going to make through a duct. So maybe you have ducts that release that stuff out into the into this um, canal. Uh, what's different? Endocrine, exocrine. Endocrine releases it without a duct into the blood. Exocrine releases it with a duct into into a, a, a space. Okay, so lots of mucus, lots of ducts. Uh, lots of arteries, vessels, and lymphatics, and things like that. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the lab portion. So other than just food moving down the esophagus, um, kind of the main homeostatic thing when you think about esophageal disorders is heartburn. So when people get heartburn, that is reflux of the acid in the stomach coming up into the, um, the uh, esophagus and burning it. Okay, because the esophagus doesn't have enough mucus uh, compared to the stomach to protect you from that hydrochloric acid. So when, when the acid gets pushed back up or regurgitates back up into the esophagus, it burns and you get that heartburn. And because the esophagus at that point is right behind the heart and it kind of feels like your heart's burning. That's why it's called heartburn. Uh, so you can see here's the diaphragm and here is the hole where the esophagus goes through the hole. Uh, some people have what's called a hiatal hernia, and I've actually heard people call it a hyena hernia, which kind of makes me laugh because a hyena is that laughing dog looking creature that you see on the Lion King and in Africa. So it's a hiatal hernia, not a hyena hernia. So I hear it a lot, so I just have to make sure that you guys make sure that you don't say hyena hernia. So a hiatal hernia, and that's when part of the stomach herniates out. And so the, the, this upper part of the stomach has actually come through the esophageal um, uh, hole and kind of out and above the diaphragm. And so you have a little bit of stomach above the diaphragm, and that's called a hiatal hernia. And sometimes that has to be, um, to be fixed, in the coat. and it can definitely cause heartburn because now you have nothing that's really preventing the acid reflux from going into the esophagus. All right, um, if you have a hiatal hernia or you have chronic esophageal reflex, that means you've got acid that's constantly in contact with the esophagus and kind of breaking that down. <coughs> Sorry. And that can lead to esophagitis, ulcers, and even esophageal cancer. So if you do have heartburn, um, don't just take a Tums all the time or try to self-medicate. If this is something ongoing, you do need to get that seen about and find out why you have heartburn. What's the root cause of that? And can it be fixed or, or medicated? Uh, because you don't want to go with untreated um, heartburn for a long time because it may be an underlying symptom of a deeper cause. It could be a hernia or something else going on that could set you up for really serious problems in the future. So don't just self-medicate and assume it's just heartburn because there's very few just any things in medicine. So if you're concerned about something, go get it checked out. All right. And that's it. So uh, we've taken our food from our mouth to the esophagus. We're down through the diaphragm now at the level of the stomach and I'll see you in the next video.